killing. Yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah. So, something like that. Oh. All right. Let's do. Uh, some slides to appear. Push the button. Right. So, hi. Um, I'm Roland. I've been playing with radio since I was about 14 years old. Uh, I took a very long break when I was traveling a great deal, but a few years ago, after becoming a permanent resident of Singapore, I decided to resume doing stuff with radio. Uh, one of the basic problems when traveling is <coughs> you end up accumulating masts and antennas and test gear and, and radios that I have with me. So that was sort of the reason for the pause. But uh, this particular mountain may in fact be vaguely familiar to people who see in some of my other talks. I'll get that in just a moment. Uh, the title refers to operating a radio station. You're actually seeing the station. So the antenna is a bit of wire. This is on a mast. Uh, the radio is actually here. Uh, this is 2,200 meters above sea level. Um, I was using it to communicate with, with a range of stations. The largest range was 3,000 kilometers. So this is near the east coast of Australia. I was talking to a station on the west coast. <coughs> and this is not with fancy new near sort of noise level digital modes. This is just voice. Um, the previous photo, sorry, if you know at the top of the mountain, because it's in a wilderness area, the Park Service decided not to repair the trig station when it was destroyed. So that sort of broken down tripod uh, also serves to identify the mountain. Uh, here is a 20 year old photo taken on the same mountain. You'll notice the trig station room in the background and uh, a very long haired person in the front. Um, here with a, a rig doing something different uh, 20 years ago. So it sort of begs the question why go up to the same mountain again with gear? And the answer <coughs> is it was a different experiment. What I was doing 20 years ago was on VHF. Uh, the range involved was only 160 kilometers, which is less than the distance to the horizon. So it's very much a, a line of sight activity. Um, it was using 25 watts of power, which for our batteries is quite difficult. It's quite a substantial battery. And required four day packs worth of gear, and therefore three assistants to get the stuff up to the top of the mountain. By the time this photo <coughs> was taken, one of the assistants had walked back down. Uh, what I did in January was on a much lower frequency. Um, almost 20 times the range and in on one occasion a tenth the power. Uh, all the gear fitted comfortably into one day pack in addition to a litre of water. Uh, so there's, there's differences in, in the, what these two frequencies can achieve. There's also part of my own interest in radio and indeed in electronics which is working on the electronics for these lower frequencies is, is a whole lot simpler than working on the electronics for VHF and UHF. You have wires big enough to see and it's a bit relaxed about routing. The moment you're working in the high frequencies, things like the length and shapes of circuit board tracks start to matter. So if you want to start playing with the electronics of radio, HF is a much, much easier place to start. And so that was really the other half of the reason for getting myself back into HF. Uh, a note on propagation. So the, there are similarities in antennas, although it's not very obvious. The antenna on the left is an array of elements about a meter long. They're symmetrical, but standing vertically. The antenna on the right, it's actually two antennas, um, is a V-shaped piece of wire, uh, 10 meters long for one frequency, that is to say 10 times the size, and 20 meters long for the other frequency, or 20 times the size. The sizes of the elements are in inverse ratio to the, to the frequency. Uh, but the propagation mode is completely different. For the VHF, it's line of sight. It was talking to a, another radio station, repeated basically on another mountain, 160 kilometers away. For the HF uh, case, it's using the Earth's ionosphere. We're at the bottom of 60 kilometers of gas air called the atmosphere. Above that is a little over 900 kilometers of ionized gas or plasma, which is called the ionosphere. Parts of the ionosphere have increased density of electrons or ions, uh, particularly the D, E, and F layers that are dense enough to refract radio waves but only, or reflect or reflect, refract, but only in certain frequency ranges. And so the three to 30 megahertz or HF range happens to be about the sweet spot for using the ionosphere for this purpose. When you're all the way up at 145 megahertz, what I was doing 20 years ago, it would just pass straight through these layers and go out to space. So it happens that for this range of frequencies, it is possible to use the ionosphere to conduct your communication far beyond the line of sight. If you get to a 3000 kilometer line of sight, you'd have to be in space. So to get to, 3,000 kilometers from 2,200 meters above sea level requires somehow that your signal's bent. And so it's somewhere in one of these layers my signal was being reflect reflected and or refracted. Uh, 
to get a sense of, of where, um, there are actually three mountains involved. Uh, but just because I did a couple of trial runs in mountains of Victoria that you can drive up to uh, before like, trying on the Mount Twining, which requires a, a four hour walk to your house. So the 3,000 kilometer contact was from Bunningham to Perth. And for context, it's way out here. That's about 3,600 kilometers, I think, so it's, it's only a little bit further. Um, Mount Twining is almost 600 kilometers further east, and I was not able to communicate quite so far. But certainly, so the, the first tests I did on New Year's Eve were to drive up two peaks in Victoria uh, with a couple of friends and operate. This is my first time ever operating on HF. I'm a terrible beginner with this stuff. And so it was helpful to have friends around me who were themselves experienced amateurs uh, to learn a couple of things very quickly. And I was thinking maybe a couple of contacts in, in Victoria, in the Australian Capital Territory, probably New South Wales, maybe you know, Adelaide. And then, astonishingly, didn't realize I got a VK6, which is a, a Perth uh, station, until after I was reviewing my law. It's like, wait a minute, <laughs> I've got call signs in every Australian state. Um, and also, halfway through the process, I was suddenly getting ZL calls on that. Like, what, what's that? And they said, oh, I'm doing I'm getting, and I believe both of so I was getting uh, calls that are quite a range. And so the operation of Mount Banningon was all two and a half watts. There was an equipment problem that I'll get to in a moment. Um, and that's about where we got that very long uh, operation it was on the unintended lower power. Uh, hardware being about hardware. I will talk briefly about radios. I didn't make much in the way of electronics for this particular experiment, although I did a little bit for power. Um, what I wanted was an HF radio that would do sort of all of the frequencies and modes that amateurs care about in a portable form. So not a sort of bulky base station type radio. And I wanted it to be in widespread use. I did not want to be using some sort of weird odd radio that no one has any experience with. So the two serious contenders, uh, the the ISO 817, which is a 2001 design, it's still manufactured, but it, the design hasn't changed. It's probably the last major work anyone will ever do in an end-to-end -end analog radio with the range of capabilities that are required for an amateur radio. The Ellicraft is a much more recent design um, with a largely digital signal path, and therefore it's half the weight, 30% smaller, um, and has various conveniences that the older radio doesn't have. Nonetheless, I bought the older radio because I want to do a bunch of experiments that require modifying a radio and having access to the signal path. You can do that with a radio that's analog from end to end. You cannot do that with a radio that's mostly digital and software. Uh, one of the problems is that matching a radio to an antenna requires, or often requires, an external a separate device. In the Ellicraft's case, there's a space inside for it. In the Osis case, there's not. So it required buying another device. So it gets a bit bulky for mountain top use, but it's okay. I was able to carry it comfortably in one pack, so with all of the other stuff, so it worked. Um, the other big selection issue was uh, antenna and mast, and really looked primarily at Soda Beams, which is a UK group, and Pactena, which is uh, basically one guy uh, doing sort of crowdfunded batch work in California, I think. Um, he, his stuff is just more refined. He's thought through the stuff. He clearly does and works with people who do a lot of backpack operation. It's called Pactena. It's yeah. for backpack use, and they're I've, after weighing it up, costs were similar, but his stuff is more refined. Most importantly, the mast was selected. It's an it's, it's a extendable fishing pole, but it's 10 meters long, three <coughs> stories high. But collapsed, it will fit into a suitcase. This matters if you are flying to the place from which you're going to walk, which is exactly my situation. I live in Singapore, but I was flying to Sydney, driving to Kosciuszko, and then walking <coughs> for several hours up a mountain. So yeah, the fact that that fit into a suitcase was a deciding factor for the, for the pole. Um, for the physical accessories, the, wire, the winding handle is the same, the wire is similar, but you know, cheap soft aluminium pegs versus uh, some sort of hardened alloy with a sharper spike, they won't bend because of the, the three prong shape. Um, the S clips, which make it much, much easier to assemble stuff fast, when you're, and again this matters amount of operation, you don't typically have a lot of time on the top. Um, and also the metal. This is, so getting two wires to one bit of coax, you need a inductor basically. Um, this one works, but like really, <laughs> what were you thinking? Is again the fact that guys thought through his stuff carefully. So that was what I ended up buying. Um, I made a few extra cables and, and other patching bits. That was they, they were able to sell me parts to do so, but the, the kit itself was actually pretty good. 
The next big challenge is operating, is preparing to operate in Singapore. The noise floor here is unbelievable, and so the, it's, I've yet to have a successful communication other than a few kilometers in Singapore. Uh, but I still needed somewhere to, to set this gear up to prepare because it was not going to have a lot of time on the ground in Australia before going into the National Park. I was in Australia for three weeks, but went to the National Park on like the fourth day or something. So I uh, needed time to do set up an operation here. That's always a problem. A whole other talk on the use of Singapore Land Authority fields uh, I've done on other occasions. Uh, I'll point out today that it was helpful to have first done a bunch of antennas at Maker Fair last year. This is a sort of aerial photo of the Science Centre and all the antennas that we, we built for Maker Fair, which at least some people in the room came and saw, and at least one came and operated. Um, but, but importantly, in order to do that, I had prepared a risk assessment. And so when the Singapore Land Authority, when I finally found the right person who could actually have a concrete discussion about antennas with me, one of his first questions was, have you performed a risk assessment? Why, yes. Yes, I have. <laughs> Here's one that got through the science centre in like less than 24 hours. That was it. There were no further questions. Um, <clears throat> so the Singapore Land Authority has fields, about 1,700 fields spread across Singapore. Their role is to look after land that can be used for development but is not currently developed. As distinct from national parks, whose land is isolated permanently for recreation, um, they make they're sure that all the downtown fields that are unused get mowed regularly. That's why we have all these nice clear fields all over Singapore. That doesn't happen by itself. Um, I asked them to use all four of the crudely marked fields here, in particular because hacker space is about here. So I had in mind this one. Sorry, this one is close. Uh, this one was the walking range. Unfortunately, this is the of the four, the one they did not allow to use because it's part of the Grand Riverside Park. It gets a lot of public use, but they cleared all three of the others that were marked. And so, in fact, most of my stuff is done near the middle of this field. Big open space, no India light, um, and generally out of everyone's way, cricketers notwithstanding. Um, so, that was set up one night on that field. Uh, the mast is tall enough that the top of it is not in the frame. It's quite I had serious difficulty photographing this thing because, again, it's more than 100 metres from the nearest street light. So I'm dealing with a little flash in my, in my camera. Um, right, so far so good. So that was all sort of November, December. Uh, December 31st, as I said, I went up two mountains in Victoria with drive up access to the summit. So they have like picnic tables and that stuff on top. Um, didn't photograph the whole setup, but wanted to point out something in particular. So you've got the, the radio, the tuner, the microphone, the and the wall book there. Uh, it's an analyzer, which is a okay. useful tool. Um, because we we're going to go up three mountains that day, and we were two, I was going to exceed the battery life of the internal battery in the A17. Again, it's a 20 year old, almost 20 year old design. It uses uh, not that much. So, batteries are pretty easy. Yeah. Yeah. So, my friend brought with him a letter from Joe Self. And uh, then, plug into the uh, radio, which thought, hey, great, I can now operate for hours and three times without difficulty. Unfortunately, there is a inappropriate feature, which is to say a bug, uh, in the firmware in the radio. The power signal is this little thing, this is for the transmit power. You see power is needed. For the transmit power, you get all the three bars in there. But there are four options. Um, um, half a watt, one watt, two and a half watts, and five watts. And so what they've done, classic, it's hard to change hardware, particularly layouts of LCDs, but you can make software do stuff. So it's one bar, two bars, three bars, or three bars flashing. That gives you the four <coughs> power options. And that's what the manual says. It turns out that that's only true if you're using the internal battery. If you use the external battery, it's mostly true for those three modes. But if you're operating long distance from mountaintop, you will start at the highest power level. And it turns out that I could not get it to flash. I was cycling through the power settings, and it wasn't flashing. So I stopped at three bars, the three bars, the two and a half watts, which is why the operation well, I unexpectedly got 3,000 meters, 3,000 kilometers communication happened at two and a half watts. It was not virtue, it was like I couldn't work out how to get into five watts. Uh, it turns out that on an external source, the power meter goes blank at five watts. This was mentioned at least once, just once on a forum somewhere where somebody had worked this out, but most people use this with its internal battery. Um, then headed into the Kosciuszko National Park, which is usually snowy. I'm a member of a ski lodge that's out in the middle of nowhere. You know, this is three kilometers from the nearest road. It's away from grid power, water, gas, silver. Uh, a few things on this picture. One is the antenna is set up. It's a bit of a whole You can see it maybe the, the, um, the guy ring at the two and a half level. Uh, 
the, the bail about seven meters up, which is where he's on wire uh, attached, and up on the side is another couple of meters uh, for a vertical wall and temporary. Um, most importantly, well, some of the things that emergency shelter, people do die in this kind of disturbing the regular animals. So there's actually a side door here to crawl into. If you're stuck out here in, a, uh, in the snow, your life is in immediate danger. And so there's a door that can open there anytime and sort of wooden box that you can get into and there's blankets and water and, and dried fruit. Um, and also, the power source is solar. That has consequences. I'm there for a week. I'd like to be able to recharge the batteries in my radio. Uh, there's a clear review of the antenna in the sense of its size compared to the, the building. So the difficulty with power is the, the older part of the building, which is everything up to about this wall, is a century old. The newer part is 60 years old. The club is a little bit conservative about such things, and uh, the deal has been no power for member use. There's electric power to run lighting, to run a couple of safety alarms, and to control the water heater. The water heater burns gas, but it, but it uses an electric, electronic controller to efficiently burn gas. <coughs> And the deal has been that's the only thing that power can be used for. So there was no power stop. It. The power point you can see only went in 18 months ago. And it's not enabled at this time of year. It's during the Easter work party, it's connected, there's a generator available, yada yada yada. And generally it's only used for battery charges for cordless grills. Uh, the rest of the year it's disconnected because the fear is people will turn up with hair dryers. And most people have no idea that a hair dryer draws you know, 50 to 100 times on a battery charging towards, and certainly more than the Lodges electrical system <coughs> can deliver. Not a huge threat, but if you trip circuit breakers and the lights go out and the water heater stops working and so on. Um, at the same time, however, this went in. What's in this black box is in fact a uh, dual USB socket that goes into a cigarette light socket in the car, two amps each. And so the observation there is, again, because of safety concerns, mobile phones are now viewed as incredibly useful things do not have the ability to charge a phone if you're there for a week in the winter is now something that has safety consequences. So the club has finally agreed to make available uh, USB sockets for charging phones. So again, the design is old, it's not a 5 volt input, it's a 12 volt input. But I did the sounds, work out what it drew, figured it with a uh, DC-DC converter, I think I found it um, <coughs> that it would draw about 800 milliamps, which is well under the 2 amps available. If you look at the little current meter, it's 0 0.74 amps. It's about what I calculated. That meant I could charge the battery. That meant for the four or five days we sat there before walking up the mountain, I could operate. So, yeah. so this is the lounge room. You see the antenna in the distance. Uh, the radio is sitting here. All that because we'll be able to see the screen. Um, that's the mountain we operate. This whole mountain is now is now home. This radio is the highest. We've got the summit because we're operating out there. Uh, the weather is variable, as is always the case in mountains, uh, but it happened on about the fourth day. We're looking at the predictions, and yeah, 7 to 20 gaps every day. The probability of rain suddenly collapsed. This indicates a gigantic high pressure system. Fantastic. No rain, variable wind, perfect conditions. I managed to get my hands sunburned, but otherwise, perfect conditions. Um, that said, I didn't think to photograph it the first thing in the morning, but even after the sun had risen, that's what it looked like. The cloud was still rising. Uh, about an hour later, there was just a little bit left. Um, that's the entire station, including the stuff. So, the mast, uh, the wires, attachments, the extra coax, and spare dry lines, antenna analyzer, radio, antenna tuner, uh, logbook, critical with the license and regulations, just in case a ranger turns up. I've never seen one in 30 years of walking up this mountain, but you never know. Uh, and of course, the and a bunch of extra tools. Um, it all fits into a single day pack, which is nice, including the set of a bit of water. Uh, this is about two hours into the walk. Uh, the only thing I want to point out here was the trees. These are the last trees. It's another three kilometres from, from here to the summit, and about a 300 metre rise. I had friends out the day before, when we had to cowardly refuse to go outside, there was a hailstorm. There's, there's nothing, there's nothing to hide under at all. You're out there in a hailstorm, you've got nothing but your backpack with like quite large hailstorms. Um, the next photo is taken up on that ridge here, so we just have to zip forward three hours, two, hour and a half, two hours or whatever. Um, I've rarely seen this, or never seen it this clear. That was the cloud, as it was, and it just stayed there all day. 
So again, this is consistent with a high pressure system just sitting there. Um, zoomed out. I've never seen this. In 30 years of walking up this mountain in particular, I have never seen that far west. So it was just astonishingly clear. Day. Which meant, like I set this thing up, and it was, it's not just that it's still, there was essentially no wind up there. We were sitting in still air, which meant that the relatively flimsy pole wasn't being challenged. Um, so operate, oh god, sorry. Um, that's right, final slide. So uh, there is about a five minute video of me operating, I won't do it now for time reasons, but the, both the video and the slides are there. You must want to view them or put them later. Um, that's all for now, because I overrate my time, I think I should not take any questions, but by all means come ask later. I will find a fossil agent on that. Um, so, as I mentioned, hopefully you now all have in your hands a, a brochure or flyer for Fossil Asia. This is Asia's largest open tech conference, it's one of the largest open tech conferences in the world.